Hi, everybody. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Julie Tallman. Welcome to tonight's webinar. It's sponsored by Pre iShare, and we're talking about the secret to liquidity for passive real estate investors. There are uh, the, the things we're going to cover tonight encompass a really important movement that we have been working on here for a couple of years, and it, we've we've really found it our 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 wish and our duty to educate investors and introduce solutions that have never been provided. So we've just rolled out this technology to solve the challenges in, in passive investing in liquidity. And we're really happy to hear you to have you. We're happy to have you here tonight. So quick bit of housekeeping. We're going to record this webinar and an email will be sent out for replays. Please share it with anybody that you know that has passive real estate that that may need to find this liquidity as well, has these types of questions. Um, number two, there's a chat at the bottom of the screen and go ahead and say hello, tell us where you're from or if you won't have any comments, you can leave them there. Uh, there is a QA at the bottom of the screen that you'll see as well. This is where you're gonna wanna type any questions that you have. And we are going to make time at the end for a good Q&A for any of the questions that you have. Um, we will save that for the end because as you can imagine, a lot of your questions will be answered during tonight's presentation. So Christian Sadler is going to be tonight's uh, host and presenter. He is our VP of Investor Relations. He's the Pre I Share sponsor, uh, Pre I Share sponsored Fundication Show host, and it's important to note that he has over 20 years of, of real estate experience in commercial, residential. He's done flips. He knows the industry, um, and he knows the industry inside out. And he knows our business inside out, and so he really has been kind of the face and the mouthpiece for our company. Tonight, we have Aaron Peterson from our team. He is going to assist in tonight's Q&A. And Aaron is PreiShare's chief revenue officer. Aaron brings years of advising high growth, private public clients. And he has 15 years experience in developing global teams. Um, he's an award-winning entrepreneur and an international, internationally known speaker as well. We have two other individuals here tonight, Michael Anderson, our CEO for pre -I Share. He is a CCIM. He has 45 years of real estate experience and is really the founding force behind pre -I Share. He knows what it means to be an investor in all areas of real estate and was a sponsor for over 40 years. So he knows passive real estate investing um, very, very well has contributed to over $6 billion in in real estate transactions just by himself. <laughs> so uh, we're always, always happy to have you on here, Mike, with us as well. And last but definitely not least, Kent Anderson. He's had a very long and successful year, uh, over 20 years in institutional investment. And then he came over to the real estate side um, with a little coercion and is our chief investment officer, has a lot of experience as a fund manager and just and and knows the subject inside and out as well. So Christian, I think we're ready for you to take the lead and go over tonight's presentation. All right, let me jump in and share my screen. Okay. I'm going to run through this information as quickly as possible because I want to make sure that we give plenty of time to our uh, guests today. That's where I think you're going to get the majority of the value here, especially for some of you that I know might be watching this for the second, third, or fourth time. My information doesn't change much, but uh, the information um, that comes with the questions is, I believe, invaluable. So let's run through it because I know there may be some new folks on the line or watching this and watching the recording. And we're talking about the secret of liquidity for passive real estate investors. And when I say passive real estate investors, I I always have to clarify this because this is a term where I've been in, in the real estate investing world for uh, 18 years. I always called myself an investor, but really I was a small business owner that happened to flip properties and you know uh, transact real estate. And so a passive investor in the sense of what we're talking about is not somebody who is flipping properties or you know, out there operating short-term rental units. You know, this is not the person who has bought a uh, apartment complex and is operating that apartment complex. It's not the one that's house hacking. It's not the person that owns fourplexes. All of that is active real estate. 
And there's ways to make it more passive by hiring the right people and putting the right staff and having the right vendors. But you're always going to be active if you are the owner and the operator of that real estate. So truly what we're talking about is a passive investor. And the more and more I've learned about this industry over the last couple of years, the only true passive income comes from finding good operators and placing your money with them and let them take care of the operation side of the business while you take true passive income and you can focus on other things. So oftentimes the passive investor doesn't even look at themselves as an investor. They probably think of themselves as a, a tech professional, a doctor or a dentist or any other you know, uh, career choice that happens to invest their money into real estate. That's a that's a typical passive investor. Now I'm I'm meeting more and more people who have done it long enough that they're truly simply an investor. That's all they do. In fact, I was just on the phone with one of our uh, fund investors the other day, and they said he said, you know, I keep getting people ask me what I do these days, and what I do is read private placement memorandums. So sometimes that's what you're going to feel like if you are a passive investor is you're just going to be reading documents and trying to decide which one is the right fit for you. So this is for an investor who owns a passive interest in a current real estate syndication and wants to sell their interest. Also known as a limited partner or an LP or somebody who owns an LP position and it's typically going to be in commercial real estate. You may think of yourself as a passive investor. Now, we do have the opportunity as well, if you are a GP or a general partner inside of a real estate syndication and you have passive shares. Now, the key word there, if I haven't said it enough time, is passive. This is about passive interests in real estate. So can you relate to being in a situation where you need to liquidate that passive interest because your kids got into that Ivy League school that you've always been wanting them to get into, or maybe you're you know, next on the line for the Ferrari that's coming out, or you're thinking about these current economic times and the way that everything has changed, you just want to make sure you have liquidity. It might be that your capital is locked up and you're seeing a lot of opportunity potentially coming on the market and you're not sure how you're going to take advantage of it unless you can liquidate your current holdings. We built a solution for that, which is the pre-iShare listing hub. As far as we can tell, we are the first ever platform for you to buy and sell passive real estate shares simply and easily. Now, for as long as the industry has been around, there's been this lie out there where if you go and you talk to somebody who is sponsoring a deal, a syndicator, they're gonna tell you, listen, you know, here's the here's the uh, whole layout. We're buying this apartment complex. And if you invest, you're going to own the real estate and your money is not liquid. You're not going to be able to get your money out until the deal's done. So that could be three years, five years, 10 years down the road. And sometimes they might tell you it's going to be three or five years. And then the credit markets change like they did recently. And all of a sudden that goes to seven to 10 years, right? So here's the truth. The truth is you're <laughs> buying shares in a company. The company is what is who owns the real estate. And those shares can be bought and sold just like any other interest, except that many times they're limited by the rules in the offering documents. And I'm sure that uh, Mike can speak to this when we get to the question and answer. You know, oftentimes it was the boilerplate, you know, documents that were put together by, you know, attorneys a long time ago when these regulations came out to, to allow uh, these to be exempt securities. And it just limited and put first right of refusal in there and locks on the ability to sell your interest on the open market. So what we're doing is pioneering the ability to not have those locked up anymore. Because the real issue is this, the syndicators didn't do this because of malicious intent. Most of them want to set proper expectations with their passive investors. They want you to know if you're invested, they're not going to be able to get your money out. And oftentimes, if you ask them to get your money out, it's going to mean they're going to have to step and, and take money out of other resources or their personal funds just to make good. And most syndicators have to scale in order to make a living. 
meaning they have to continue to go out there and syndicate more deals to get to the point where they truly have enough income. They also want to know and choose who's in their deal. They want to understand who they're doing business with. They don't want to have to backfill operating transactions when they're most likely focused on the future and the next transaction. So until now, there really hasn't been somebody on the middle ground to align the interest of both the syndicator and their investors. And I look at our CEO, Mike, as the pioneer who he went from a position where he had many GP interests. And when he sold his company to his partner about six years ago, all of a sudden he switched sides. He went from having a whole bunch of GP interest to having a bunch of LP interest. And this give, gave him the foresight to help both sides, both the syndicator and the passive investor, because he is both. And he assembled a phenomenal team that I am really, truly grateful to be a part of. We are bridging industry gaps and helping syndicators and their passive investors succeed. So a little bit of our track record here, well over a hundred years of collective real estate investing experience between the team. And that doesn't include all of the expertises that we have within that group. And people who have been in this industry for decades are boasting and bragging and are celebrating what we are doing for the market. Because now buyers can go in there and buy these fractional interests. They can browse the current deals, see who's selling their secondary fractional shares, and they can buy based on proven performance. In fact, Pre-iShare actually has a fund because we see such a huge opportunity of buying these shares and creating instant liquidity for the passive investor, but also providing phenomenal returns to our passive investors inside of the fund. And for sellers, you get to sell your interest, liquidate that uh, that interest so that you can get access to your capital mm. and you can have in, you can have offers from accredited investors, meaning they can slot right into your spot in a 506C and they can take your position and your sponsor is probably going to be pretty excited because they just got a brand new investor without having to put out any advertising, without having to host any events, without having to show up to any dinners, they got a brand new investor. So it's a really simple process. You're going to set up a quick phone call, add a listing, start collecting offers, and then you'll conduct the sale. And it's your turn. We are offering right now you the opportunity to get a free listing with the Listing Hub. So if you have a fractional interest in a real estate syndication, and if you have LP shares and you would like to see how much you can get in an offer, simply go to preishare.com forward slash free listing right now, and we will give you your first listing for free. And the beautiful part about it is, I mentioned our fund a little bit, we have capital waiting to be put to work to buy these interests. So we would like to make you an offer. Go ahead and go to that spot and let's get your listing on the listing hub. Now's the exciting part. I have the opportunity to again introduce three gentlemen that I have a tremendous amount of respect for. I am grateful to work side by side with them and build this incredible business and opportunity to change the marketplace. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it back to Julie and let her field questions so that you guys can hear from Mike, Kent, and Aaron. And if I can manage, I'll try to be quiet throughout it, but I might have some words to say as well. <laughs> That's fair. All right. We do have some questions that have come in. So uh, the <clears throat> first one is says, I'm not an accredited investor. Can I use your listing hub? Uh well, yeah, you you could go on, for example, um, you can sell a fractional interest that you might have inherited or come into otherwise. Uh, so you can certainly sell and not have to be an accredited investor. Uh, but we don't restrict you looking on the listing hub uh, if you're not accredited. It's just you won't be able to purchase without an accreditation. So let's take it a step further and just answer for people who can list um, they don't have to be accredited. They, as Christian said, they do have to have a passive okay. share, right? Yeah. Are there any other things that we need to say out that in terms of just who can invest or who, who can list with us? 
So anybody can list. Uh, there's no restrictions on that. Um, for example, we have a, a lot of uh, attorneys that handle probate or divorce that have to liquidate those assets. And they have the ability to put those assets on the listing hub. Um, we, we've had people have received an, uh, uh, their ownership in an investment through uh, an estate settlement or it was willed to them. They can certainly list. There's no restrictions from the Securities and Exchange Commission for selling it. It's just that you have to be an accredited investor uh, uh, to prove the sophistication and financial means to protect yourself in order to purchase on it, on the listing hub. That's the only distinction. Mike, I have a question that I would lead on from that. Um, you, you've done sponsorship for a while, and there's a, you know, when, when I lost my father um, at the age of nine years old, uh, there was a bunch of assets that my my parents were divorced, and there was a bunch of assets that my grandma was managing, and we didn't know. Big box of them. When my grandma passed away, I got this box, and it came, and inside of it was literally real estate and diamond mines and all these crazy investments. And uh, inside of there were some fractional real estate deal pieces as well. And what I found was that the sponsors didn't know where to send the checks when the people died. Uh, and then I guess they went to the state and then we went to some lost money thing and found it. Have you ever ran into this before? And and so when those uh, investments come into play, like where would you send the checks to? Yeah, so that actually should have gone to the, the probate attorney or whoever, ha whoever handled the probate should have got a hold of the sponsor and removed the deceased individual from the capital stack from the uh, uh from the group of investors and replaced it with the heir. <clears throat> but a lot of times they don't know to do that. Um, and, and a lot of times I, I find the attorneys just really, uh, in settling in the state, just really don't know how to treat that asset. You know, and so they're not really sure what the responsibilities are of the person inheriting it, and what they need to do to ensure that they protect their interests and so forth. And I, that's one of the biggest, um, I, I think, most interested parties in what we're doing is the probate attorneys, um, just because it gives them a way to liquidate that asset, especially when there's been willed to more than one heir. So I have a, sorry, a follow-up question myself. So <clears throat> let's say that uh, they have this asset, you know, that the syndication, syndicated asset, and they... Uh, it's sitting on the book and they don't per se know what to do with it, as you said. I mean, I can't even imagine, I guess, what happens. I, I, where, do, where do they look to to know that if if there's an asset that they can't sell or they don't know how to maybe approach the sponsor? Man, what's what's what I think of one actually recently that we were going to have Earl Klein on the show and he died from a, a motorcycle accident like four days later. Like who who takes over all of those in that situation? Yeah, again, it's whoever's probating, but they 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 really need to get a hold of their uh, the sponsor. The way the operating agreements are typically written is that there is a successorship in the uh, in, in the ownership of that fractional interest. And it's written into it, so it inures to the benefit of the person who acquired it, of course. And then it, after that, uh, at, if something were to happen to that person, then it would go to the uh, to the heirs uh, or their assigns. They can make it assignable, but um, in most cases, but the attorney would have to know to reach out to the sponsor and, and make sure that those changes were made. Makes in, sense it, uh, on their side. Um, but I mean, that's part of what we what. Pre-iShare was designed to do with the listing hub. But that's what we one of the things we wanted to accomplish is, is that is to take control of the liquidation process of those kind of assets when they need to, when that needs to happen, rather than having them just controlled basically by the sponsor. Perfect. And I think the reason why that uh, many people have a hard time understanding that is because they get an idea, they have an idea of what to do with stocks and bonds and stuff like that because those are traded. Nobody yeah. ever has seen real estate traded in this fashion, if it were, then of course they would be able to understand it better. But since it's not been traded that way, it's there's there's a thought that 
what, what do I do with this? How do I, yeah. how do we get value to, to, and with, to the and with 10,000 yeah. plus baby boomers retiring a day right now, I got to imagine there's a lot of this coming up on the horizon that, you know, it's going to be a lot of opportunities for liquidation and, and, in the contract of the will, so a will is a contract, but the sponsorship's a contract, right? So if there's a will that has to be split up amongst multiple kids, does that fractional interest get spot split up amongst multiple kids in those sponsor contracts? Or or do they have to be liquidated because there isn't a way to split them up in that situation? Yeah, see, that's that's the big problem is when you have more than one, one heir to that same interest. Um, Presumably what would happen and what normally happens is because there was not really a great way to liquidate that interest, then they would end up splitting the income. Mm. But what would traditionally happen then, and it complicates it, the more errors you add to that interest is, is that somebody says, I need my money now, you know, so they, can you buy me out of my interest and so forth? And, and then there, or maybe we should just sell it back to the sponsor or something like that. And, and and take a little bit of a loss on it. And and that's what causes some real consternation and uh, problems between family members when, you know, you're not necessarily fighting over gets, who gets mom's dining room set. They're fighting over, you know, a financial asset like that. I so, totally agree. So the best way to do those is obviously to liquidate the asset and split the uh, proceeds. Makes Many sense. times the two sponsors are not uh, wanting to, to have an awful lot of heirs come on there either because they wouldn't be accredited investors in many cases and certainly not sophisticated many of them to be able to to be make a contribution to the uh, ownership of that investment amongst uh, all the other owners. Um, I suppose one way though that could make it easier then for the, the investors if if the original investment was in an LLC and many times uh, we see a lot of people investing through diff different entities, but where it's not the case, then you have the complication that Mike was talking about there. Interesting. We've got a couple questions here that have come in in regards to how people can use the listing hub. Uh, so the first one that's come up says, I understand it has to be passive, which Christian did a great job of driving home. Um, and we can't say it enough, but can I list any asset type of real estate? Uh, depends on what you mean by asset class. A anything that's a passive ownership in income producing real estate, the answer is yes. And, it can, and also, I guess it could be non-producing. Uh, we have several people that own land uh, that they own a fractional interest in and they would like to sell, you know, and that can be done too. It, I don't think it's as easy, but, it, you know, that's it, another asset. But yeah, as long as it's income producing commercial real estate, that, that seems to fit our, what the market was built for. We've had okay. some people come to us also with non-traded REITs. Yeah, private REITs. And so uh, are we doing non-traded REITs too? The private REITs? Yeah. Um, we still got a couple of uh, legal hurdles to jump first, but I mean, we definitely can do them. Yeah, that that was what is one of the things that was planned to do is because those would be the easiest of all to trade. Um, and it's easy to get valuation on those. Um, and another reason I would like to see it happen is because I ended up with a bunch of them. Yeah, for sure. So, but, but it's just, you know, it's just like a non-listed stock. It, it's still a security. So, yeah. you know, that's, that's what it was built to do is provide liquidity to those kind of assets too. So absolutely. Yes. We got a two part question here. How much can I sell my listing for? And if I'm able to sell on your site, how much do I lose in fees to pre iShare? You want to take that one, Kent? I, I see you smiling already. Um, you can sell it to whatever the market's willing to buy for it because essentially it is a marketplace. Um, uh, you know, many times you can go to your sponsor and get an idea of what the value of the, of the deal may be worth. Uh, as a total, and they may even break it down based on your ownership percentage in the deal. 
Uh, many times sponsors have uh, regularly get a, a, a broker opinion, a value on the property, or if they have to do a refinance, they have to go get an appraisal. Those are good sources for the underlying asset that you can use then to value your interest. Of course, if you're wanting to put it out there, of course, and sell your interest, that would also be a good document to include uh, from your sponsor to be able to sell your investment is uh, to be able to establish value for it. I think that a lot of people, including me, as the fund manager for pre ISHA, would love to see stuff like that. So uh, I would get that if you can get that from your sponsor. Usually, they most sponsors try to go out about once a year to get something like that and, and uh, to give their investors an idea of what their investment might be worth. Uh, if you don't have something like that, um, then ways to value your investment is you can go to your sponsor and ask, okay, what's the cap rate for that investment, which is like an interest rate. It usually follows interest rates. But in, the, in that submarket for that type of asset, what cap rates or what cap rate range would there be for that? Then you can use the uh, financials the sponsors give you to simply take the net operating income divided by that cap rate. Um, and you have to look at the net operating income for your particular investment. So you would apply uh, if you own 10% of the deal, 10% of the NOI of the property, say for the, the, the trailing 12 months or trailing six months, whatever you want to look at there, whatever you think is reasonable, apply that according to the cap rate and then use that as a basis for valuing your investment. Um, other ways to do it, though, beyond that is you're, you're going to look at um, demand for real estate. You know, in the coming coming year, we're going to see interest rates going down cap rates, what they may be right now, may not be what you want to sell it for. You may think forward to that and say, okay, you know, cap rates had been 6% for my asset in this investment, but, you know, when rates were lower, it was selling at a 5% at a cap rate, giving me a much better return. So I might want to capture some of that difference between the six and the 5%. So those would be various things you could use to do it. But at the end of the day, it's whatever anybody's willing to pay for it once it gets out there on the listing hub. One thing I've been so can, uh, can I just clarify that to make that one clear? So you said take the net operating income and divide it by what? By the cap rate for that market. So if uh, my cap net rate operating is, income, let's say is 50,000 and the cap rate's 8%, that only is like four grand. So is that my, I, I don't understand. Fully. Well, yeah, cap yeah. rates, cap rates is an important measure that a lot of people use to value investments. When, I started out in, in doing uh, real estate syndication there with my brother about 20 years ago. 20, oh my gosh, 22 years ago, Mike. Oh, it's <laughs> divide. That's what like yesterday. <laughs> um, it's divide, not times. Aaron, Aaron divided, my bad. Or, yeah, or you, were, say, you did do the so, math right. I was just about ready to correct you. Okay, so $50,000 of, of net operating income. Times that by, let's say the cap rate's 0.08. Divide it. Divide, divide, divide by 0.8. Divide. We appreciate that. Divide that 0.8. And so my valuation of my $50,000 uh, uh, share portion of my syndication is 625000 about. Yep. But then it's just whatever somebody's willing to buy that, whether that be the operator or other. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the secret, I just wanted to add the secret to getting, because when I was with real source, you know, we, we would buy them, we'd buy those interests back, but we wouldn't buy them at necessary fair market value. We, we would try to just buy it to make the investor whole realizing that their needs had changed and they need to get their cash back. And it would be the same thing if they took it to somebody else that was already inside of that SPE, one of the other owners, because you're not really getting a, a, enough of market exposure. The trick is today is, to get it to general market conditions where you can get a lot of people that are interested in purchasing. One of the things that drives cap rates down over the last few years is there's been more real estate, or there's been more uh, money in the real estate market than there was real estate. And that's what drove returns down, you know? So that increases value, value of the real estate. So, one of the great advantages you have on the listing hub is you get much more exposure, which gives you a much better chance of getting a really great offer. Well, and that's really key. I mean, this is just like selling anything. It's going to come down to your ability, you know, in some cases to sell that opportunity. If you can show the upside of what the uh, operator is planning on doing, how they plan on 
uh, adding or ha have already added value um, and the potential for the, the transaction, because some of these, if you try to go off of cap rate and they're still doing their value add, you you not may, you may not get to your value uh, that you're looking for. But if you can sell just like you, you know, bought into the deal based on the pro forma, if you can essentially put that out there and help the next investor see the opportunity there, they may be willing to buy that at a higher premium. And if it does have cash flow and that cash flow has been consistent, some investors are willing to pay more for cash flow that is proven than cash flow, cash flow that is projected. So this really is an opportunity for you to sell that listing based on what you believe the value is. You are going to be limited, of course, and you, uh, you know, somebody buying it most likely is going to be doing some math to figure out what they want to pay for it. Right. That's that's the big thing, Christian. And there's two big things that I could take away from what you just said there that are huge difference between selling on the listing hub, what you're selling there versus what you bought when you originally bought it. When you bought it, you bought it based on performer. You didn't have an asset that had a track record. That is huge. That's going to be a big thing for any potential buyer. And they're willing to pay extra to get that. Um, you know, if you've got something that's cash flowing well, they're going to pay extra to get that. And so that's going to provide more value maybe than what a cap rate would do because it's got good cash flow and it's being managed well. Yeah. Um, then another thing that you're, you're giving a potential buyer there, that's going to make your asset worth more in addition to that track record, which reduces the risk of that investment. The other thing you're giving them is the, the short cycle investing, which is a big thing. That's the reason why pre-iShare is establishing our fund is because we like the short cycle investing. So if it, the investment was going to be held for five years and you're selling the deal two, maybe three years into it with a, a good track record, so you've got less risk. Well, the potential buyer is buying that track record, but we're buying it with two to three years left on that five-year investment horizon. So they're going to be, be able to, to get a, a, a quicker gain. So it's going to provide good turnover for them, for their for their investment, um, you know, because it's the it's the dynamic re-leveraging of, of real estate where you make an awful lot of your money in real estate. Um, and you can't do that holding it for longer periods of time. And so that, that's going to give that 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 buyer that opportunity to do short cycle investing, you know, um, so it's, it's a great, great opportunity for the buyers out there. And so uh, re realizing that, then you might be able to get better than what if the sponsor was going to go out and sell the deal themselves because, because you're selling a deal with a track record and you're selling a deal with short cycle investing. Yep. Thank and you. Add to the other side of that question, just to make sure that they don't think we're dodging it here. As far as fees to pre iShare, it's a flat fee listing service. And so I was going to circle back to that. I didn't <laughs> okay, ignore you, Julie. <laughs> we do have um, we do have a, an escrow uh, service that we're working through third party. There will be some nominal fees to utilize that, which will help with proving ownership and uh, handling the transaction. Um, I think it'll be optional, uh, but I definitely know that uh, we're going to move towards utilizing that. And I would suggest to everybody else as well. But as far as you um, listing your shares, it's a flat fee. And right now, if you're on this webinar, you have the opportunity to have that flat fee waived for your first listing. And we're yeah. doing that because we want to see this thing take off. Uh, we want investors to come out and investors and buyers to get out there and get the activity going on this marketplace. Because the more we see in terms of activity, the more it's going to help us for the way we do make money, which is going to be through our fund, doing the same thing that I just described to Christian. Uh, buying deals with a track record with short cycle investing. That's exactly how we're going to make money as, as a company. Um, so that's, that's the opportunity and why we would want to do that for people out there on this listing hub. We created it for that purpose. It's going to help other buyers besides us. I'm glad you said that. Ken. One question we have here is, is your fund going to buy all the good investments and leave what's left for the rest of us? Ooh. Cherry picking. Cherry good picking one, deals. Right. Yeah, we're absolutely going to try. <laughs> <laughs> no, the truth it, of the it, matter it, is the competition is already fierce. Yeah, we're, the opportunities are, are the opportunities show up to the the buyers the same times it shows up to us. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, as much as we think that we could buy them all and would love to buy them all, very very slim chance. We've already got a lot of fierce competition out there. 
and they get they have the same opportunity as we do. They see in the same time we do. So, I, well, I the think is, our buy box is going to be different than somebody else's as well. For so, sure. Yeah. yeah, we've got, you know, we've got the the fund that allows for fairly broad opportunities for us, but coming out of the gates as a brand new fund, we're pretty tight on what we're going to do. Yeah. I think what I love the most is like when Mike first approached me about this amazing idea, I love something that he said to me and ultimately why I was very interested to be a part of it. And he said to me, he said, Aaron, you know, my, one of my goals before I die is rather than when I die, I, you know, leave my kids a bunch of money or something like that. I'd rather sell that, not burden them with the, the sell of what happens to this asset after the fact. And quite frankly, I want to sell it and see what they do with my money while I'm still alive. You know, and so I just I absolutely loved that and in in coming to work with Mike, honestly, you know, so. Yep. Yeah, it's, that's kind of important, Be, being able to enjoy it while, while you're still around. You know, 10 years for me right now is a long time to be an investment. But might not see that money come home. Yeah, right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. This might be a great question to wrap up Q&A. We don't have any other questions at this point. This is how do I talk to my syndication group about this listing hub process and what do I need from them to go forward with a listing? The good news is, is we can take care of that for you if you would like. Uh, they, We've got all the information out on our website that a sponsor would need to have if you want to do that yourself. But we would love the opportunity and our success rate so far. What are we batting, Mike, on this? Everybody we talked no, to sponsor No one said no. Yeah. So, yeah. 100%. Yeah. I mean, the sponsors love this. It's a good it's a good reason why, a good, good thing for the sponsors. They love it. As Christian was talking about in his presentation, sponsors get free investors out of this. These days, that's a really wonderful opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. I remember when we started out doing the syndications there over 20 years ago, back in 2002, Mike, we were paying several thousand dollars per investor. Right. And and now they can get them for free this way. And so it's a, it's a good thing, a good accredited investors for free. And well, they don't the lose things, their existing investor either. The other things are for a sponsor that would induce them, because having done this for 42 years, you know, and half that time with my brother at my side, once there's several things about this that are so attractive to sponsors that are so compelling for them to say yes. Uh, one of them is you want to keep your existing investors happy. That's the most important thing. Uh, but the second thing is once you can start talking about liquidity in real estate, which is something we've never talked about, as as Christian so painfully pointed out the big lie um, that you know is in the industry is that we just didn't want to be in the business of buying and selling our own shares all the time. But once that liquidity got built into the system, instead of you know, 70% of the people having to say no because they couldn't have their money tied up for that long, uh, a higher percentage of them can say yes because they control when their money comes back out. So that means that uh, it makes their life so much more easy uh, when they, in respect to when they go out to raise capital, just to being able to say, yeah, we're part of the pre ice sheriff system. Uh, liquidity is built into your investment. And we're happy to accommodate that because then in the future, that does not become um, a restraining point in people investing in future funds. You know, there's nothing that goes right along with that, Mike. It, a very astute sponsor brought to our attention. I remember on uh, one of the, the uh, uh, one of the fundication shows there with Christian, when he said to us, he said, yes, I get more investors. But the other thing I also get out of that is because it is a liquid investment at that point, and the perception is different. It's no longer an illiquid investment. It's a it's a liquid investment. Then the return requirements is traditionally associated with illiquid investments go away and become what you have for a, a liquid investment. And so yeah. the, the, sp the sponsor then can go out there and find deals that work for a different set of investors that don't need such incredibly high IRRs in order to be able to invest. Yep. They can get more, they, they can get deals that make more sense to them and they end up taking a lot less risk in doing that. Uh, the best sponsors are, are very concerned about risk and uh, are very much concerned about trying to buy the right kind of deals. And, and many of them sat on the sidelines when cap rates compressed the way they did not buying deals. Well, if their return requirements go down, 
because of their, they've now got investors that don't need that kind of high return. They can then buy deals that make sense at better rates. Yeah, and and Kent, the great thing about that too is you think that through all the way through to its logical conclusion. The real main risk that any real estate investor makes or syndic syndicator makes is in the debt. Uh, real estate never goes to zero unless you give it back to the bank. You know, so so that's your primary source of risk. And what who you're seeing in the last few years that have been in trouble are the ones that were high risk investments with kind of sketchy uh, underlying debt, you know, where they didn't have rate locks in or variable rate loans or stuff like that. And they were high leveraged. So they're kind of living on the edge anyway. This will encourage uh, syndicators to use more equity in their raises. So that they'll have a lower loan to value ratios, which means that there is more cash flow, a lot less risk, you know, and the industry gets a better reputation. So you don't see nasty headlines about, you know, uh, syndicators losing, you know, millions of dollars of investor capital, you know, because the bank had to foreclose. So I, I just think that it solves a lot of problems in the industry. And it's not hard once you sit down and start talking to us, a, uh, a sponsor that that's really paying attention, really want, and wants to be a good sponsor. They immediately buy into the program. Yeah. So send them, send them a link to this video. Uh, it'll be out on our website. If you want to convince your sponsor there, I think there's a lot of information in what we just said here that would help them or just have them talk to us. We'd be happy to do it. We love talking to the sponsors and going through this and, and talking about how to make this available to their, their investors. And it's really very simple. Um, it's just a simple uh, language, sample language that we can provide that they can just add to their operating agreement. And, and, and then that becomes available instantly to all their the investors in, in each one of those deals that they do that with. Hey, before we uh, end this webinar, I'd, I'd love to come back to Aaron. Aaron, I know that you're traveling across the country constantly. You're meeting with different family offices, very high net worth individuals. How do you see this changing the market for those people that are dealing with money at a higher scale? Um, I, I mean, the, the big thing I would say is the people that have money at a higher scale ultimately are utilizing these types of assets and putting them into their notes of their book. But where I do see the biggest opportunity that's happening is when somebody passes away by far and the new beneficiaries of the of those assets that are being managed by maybe a private family or a private wealth uh, management fund or a bank, somebody's now passed away and the beneficiaries are taking uh, what I would call outs, right? And so, and, and ultimately that's where we're seeing a lot of LP uh, liquidation. And so does that answer the question? Yeah, I think it does. About I what you were looking think, for there. You know, I'd so. love to just talk about, um, you know, the big picture of this. Because the other thing I see when we go back to valuating you know, there's different buyers out there and all of them have their different niches that they like to buy in. And I, I was, as we were talking, I was thinking about development, for example. There's many of these syndications that are development. And you'll see investors out there that are very comfortable in that space, but they've retired from doing the operations. So they're going to watch. And if they see one that is already past entitlements, that's when they invest. Some of them, they'll say, well, once you get the uh, horizontal done, then I'll invest. Once you get the vertical done, then I'll invest. So there's every opportunity along the way. And that's just one example of one asset you know, type that your value goes, goes up over time. And it's just hard to realize that value up until now, because usually you don't get to realize that value until ultimately there's a capital event, either there's a refinance or a sale. And now you have the opportunity to potentially realize some of that value today. Yeah. And that's, I will say that's, other... that's a great point, Christian, because I mean, when you're doing new construction or major construction on a property, that most of that gain during the time that you hold it is going to be after that construction is done and you've got the property leased back up. Yet many sponsors in those situations, when they put in that kind of work on that kind of investment, they want it to be one of their core investments and they usually want to hang on to it for a long time even when a lot of the gain for the under, for the investors has already taken place at that point. And so that's a say, great time to get it listed is, is at that point to, to get that gain at that point. Agreed. I will say one other thing that's, that's I think more recent in the last few weeks, and that is 
you know, I would, I would say that the market overall was still pretty um, commercial banks and direct credit banks. So middle market banks were still doing real estate deals heavily and issuing credit through some, some, some through their own uh, uh, funds and terms, but a lot of that has gone away in the last week or two. Um, a, a gentleman that I follow closely, uh, um, Tilo Moritz on LinkedIn, uh, he's the liquid asset manager out of Germany, tagged me in a post yesterday, and it literally showed a direct credit fund, uh, a banking falling through the floor, like the sharpest curve I've ever seen. And this is not a bad thing. And in, in my opinion, it's a great thing for the market. And the reason it's a great thing is because there we we at pre share know um, our fund is very focused and funds are very focused based off of their you know PPMs and their LPAs. Our fund is very focused. There's a lot of capital and cash that has been raised for debt financing, debtor in possession, uh, for turnover for things like uh, uh, big buildings that are being built in San Francisco and Oregon and, 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 and office buildings and conversions and all these different areas. And, and all that money has been raised and it's waiting to be deployed. And, and as long as the, the direct credit Issuing capital. And, and those funds won't be deployed. And so I think that we're in a really great market where now we're going to start to see opportunity and more people are going to list on the hub because of this. They're, they're not going to be able to go to, to traditional refinancing situations. And so we are going to see an uptick in people listing on the listing hub and a way for funds to actually be utilized in acquisitions and purchases like that. So I'm really excited where the market is for this. And it gives the ability for private family offices to, to invest in more opportunities and, and collateralize you know, a lot of their holdings in a way where they can pledge into opportunities to make gains back that aren't just the bonds and the yields percentages. Those will fall again soon too. And we'll make uh, good money in funds that we've uh, uh, contributed to or, or, or put pledges into. Good well point. said. So again, folks, just wanted to throw this up here. If there's any questions, now is your time. Also, if you want to claim your free listing, we're only going to be doing this for a limited time. So go ahead and go to preishare.com forward slash free listing. Any final questions? We haven't had any other questions come in. Uh, any any uh, last tidbits you as the pre i share team want to share? I just want to thank Aaron for that last little insightful bit of information. That was excited to work with more people. Yeah, really interesting. Perfect. Really thank you. And if you're watching, I, I, I think we need to hear the Ken Anderson joke wrap it up every time, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you want me to do one of those? So what happens usually with the team here is for those who aren't aware of this, I, whenever we have meetings, I usually provide a, a dad joke at the end of the month thing. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll give you one. You want, you want a dad joke? Let's do it. All right. So I Google. I do. It, it made my whole day every time you give them. So <laughs> I Googled recently on how to start a wildfire and I got back 48,500 matches. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> that nice. That makes sense. And nice. With right that guys. said, it's perfect. If you are part of an investment club or you know anybody that needs this service, reach out to us. And as always, we're here to help you get your free listing. Go to preishare.com forward slash free listing. And thanks for joining us tonight, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.